We had a bear report come out, a short report from the bear cave, and they mentioned our good friend Arnie. They said the retail investor hype around Pounder is hard to miss. One Pounder investor launched Pounder Bullets, a newsletter, blah, 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 blah. This went up to like 50,000 people, so I hope uh, you got some more attention from that, Arnie, because that's amazing. He quoted someone on Reddit saying, I can't believe I'm back in the green. I invested at $35, kept averaging to $13.76. I never sold because I trusted in Daddy Carp. That was epic. Every word he said on earnings renewed my vigor for investing. I cannot wait till Palantir hits $100 a share, and then the rest of it is for paid subscribers. So I guess let's start with you, Arnie, since you were the star of this uh, short report. What were your thoughts on the report, why it was published, when it was published, and, and then basically saying retail is a cult and calling you the cult leader? Well, uh, I'm not the cult uh, leader, but uh, hey, <laughs> I, um, I didn't expect uh, something like that at all. I, I just uh, was connect, uh, said uh, on Twitter, hey, you have been mentioned by the Bear Cave. I was like, the Bear Cave? Like that Bear Cave? <laughs> because for who hangs around uh, on uh, Twitter, the Bear Cave is like uh, the biggest uh, newsletter on Substack, uh, one of the highly, uh, most highly regarded uh, that is specialized on uh, writing reports on companies that uh, tend to be fraudulent. And uh, hey, is Palantir fraudulent? Like, holy shish, I mean, maybe I'm, it's missing something. <laughs> and uh, I found it, well, it is good to be mentioned. But apart from that, uh, I was really curious to actually read because, uh, hey, maybe I'm, uh, I'm stupid, I'm missing something big. And said, okay, let's uh, buy the report and actually test. I'll tell you, I feel I never wasted uh, so much money in so little time. But why? Because uh, what are the most uh, relevant critics we have been discussing so far uh, with Palantir? Consultancy. How, go how true is Palantir as a consultancy? It's like saying uh, Tesla is an automotive. It's like... Uh, Yes, it is kind of true, but if you only look at it that way, you're, it means you're not doing a proper research. Like there is a component clearly deriving from the automotive, as in Palantir there is a clearly a component that not, uh, is uh, generated from a consultancy business. But uh, thinking that the company is that and saying, the company is a black box and nobody understands. But I understand that he's an AI imposter. That's completely illogical already at the first sentence. And uh, how it backs that? Well, uh, no mention to the gross margins because so far it's uh, um, impossible that uh, a consultancy company has an 80% gross margin unless uh, it is uh, an accounting fraud. So show me the accounting fraud, please. No mention of accounting fraud. So the way the report justifies uh, these uh, claims is uh, going back to old reviews uh, or to comments saying, uh, oh, yes, there's a consultancy component. It's like, uh, okay, I mean, is the best uh, <laughs> you, you can do. I would be um, really scared of thinking uh, I write some, some BS like that, not backed by fact to 45,000 people. Like I'm really yeah. scared now when I, sc I share something on 2,000 people thinking to reach such a big audience that gets uh, also on uh, writers, on Bloomberg, uh, with uh, full of BS is like, uh, I would not do that. Because uh, what they're saying is uh, literally the same complaints we have been discussing. And then the second big point is uh, SPACs. I mean, SPACs, uh, like last year, I was already tired of discussing SPACs. Because uh, we had proof that, okay, it is a bold bet, weird bet, uh, call it however you want, uh, that didn't go through. But if you look at from uh, a player standpoint, basically what Palantir did was invested 400, getting the commitment to receive uh, 700 or more, I don't remember. Meanwhile, you generate R&D, you help uh, the business actually be tested, be spread, uh, and uh, that uh, was uh, a, a part of uh, the revenue growth, no doubt about that. But uh, if is Palantir an investment holding company? Because if Palantir was an investment holding company, basically making all the business uh, with uh, these uh, contracts, I would be scared, honestly. But uh, since SPACs, even if they went all to zero, 
the revenues are now from them are gradually declining because some of them go bankrupt. And the company, meanwhile, managed to get Gap profitable. It's like, okay, I mean, uh, this is a nothing burger. It's something that we already digested, even <laughs> too much. Even, even when the report uh, from the New Street Journal in uh, December, October, uh, that period came out about SPACs, it was, okay, what's the news? Like, there, there's literally nothing new. And uh, final point was uh, salespeople complaining on Glassdoor. And again, we have been discussing this uh, months ago, but how come you don't match that with actually what clients say on Gartner? Because maybe the people who are fired or they just don't fit with a culture, it is normal that uh, they complain on Glassdoor. But Arnie, you, you got the whole say? report? You read through the whole bear report? I have the whole report, yes. So, is the, so you're saying it was SPACs, uh, well, consulting, and, and Glassdoor. That, those were his three arguments? Yes. That is such a bad report. And uh, I would say, wow. I for someone who builds build its name uh, by spotting fraudulent companies, I think yeah. it is uh, very irresponsible to do something like that. And actually saying a company like this is an AI imposter, I would say you are the imposter. <laughs> in uh, The day before, but, the, the morning of AIP conference, without even watching the conference, you say that I'm, it's AIP fraud. I mean, that's tough. It's, it's, Arnie, Arnie said it all, but I, I just keep in mind our three letter agencies and the most important part of our defense system uses this software and has for over a decade. Show me another software company that is battle tested, that three letter agencies are using. The only other two companies that are IL-6 certified are Amazon and Microsoft. And the last time I checked, those aren't frauds. So I think someone just wants some attention. <laughs> or, I mean, this is a short report written by someone who claims uh, I don't take the position against uh, because I want to be neutral and I want to be paid by subscription. However, this creates the incentive for someone else to basically use him as a distributor. So maybe that was a move uh, paid and so far we don't know. Yeah, I mean, and, that, that was my biggest maybe, thing. Go ahead, maybe go ahead. there's not uh, a disclosure required uh, to do that. He's a distributor. He's like uh, a newspaper. So no, but that, that's a real point because look, he has 45,000 subscribers. There is definitely things that have happened. I mean, I've gotten these crazy offers where people be like, Hey, if you just publish this, we'll give you a shit ton of money because you have influence and obviously you don't disclose it. Right. It's, it's a very unethical thing to do. But if he's not short the stock and he's putting a, a paywall behind the short report, and you just told me the short report is three arguments that are really bad arguments. He might have got paid to do it, or he might be trying to get the transaction revenue from that $64 to finance his report. When in reality, if you were just short the company and you put out the report and hundreds of thousands of people read it and sold the stock because it truly was a Ponzi scheme, AI fraud, you would make way more you know, money on the downside of, of the short. And so that already made the whole, like when Hindenburg shorts, they put out the whole report. They want everyone to see it because they know if their information is legit, then Square, which they recently said they were short, should drop 70%. It dropped like 10% because no one, the short report was trash, right? So that already made it hard. Matt, what were your thoughts on the uh, short report when it came out? Uh, very much the same. I mean, I'll just keep it short and sweet. I thought it was uh, just like a lot of people. I think there's a lot of people doing very superficial coverage on the company right now because it's very popular. And, you know, I'm, I'm fine with, like I said, I'm fine with people joining the community. I'm fine with people newly finding the community. What I'm not okay with is people jumping on a bandwagon just because they think it's going to be a meme stock like it was kind of in 2021. Uh, you know, I'm all for people making their paper, but to try to get clout, you know, it's it's kind of embarrassing and a little little crappy. Uh, so I don't, I'm not a hundred percent fan of that. I mean, I was, is, I was Matt, is the, is the flip side, the company is getting so popular that as people, even on the short side are getting, are using it for clout, that that's good for the stock, just like Tesla back in 2020 with their short reports. I mean, for the overall awareness of the company, I guess. I, I don't think it's either here or there. I mean, I, I'm more of a person that kind of believes in the company, 
and the stock will follow personally, but um, it is, it is what it is in that respect. But um, I still think that the SPAC piece has time to play out. Black sky was up 8% today. Um, and maybe it was yesterday. Uh, and they're doing relatively well. They're putting rockets into space in co collaboration with rocket lab, not rockets, but pieces of, um, kit into space in collaboration with rocket lab. Tritium is making superchargers. They're blowing up across Europe. They're about to open up a, a, a plant in Tennessee, um, sign more deals in January with undisclosed oil companies. Um, so, I mean, I don't think that all those companies are dead, even though Weijo went bankrupt. You know, I still think there's there's running room, right? Um, and uh, what was the third thing? That I, they... think I think uh, Lilium, or are you looking for it? No, I'm uh, third topic. I forget what the third topic was, but it's not I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> but you made your point. Arnie, go ahead. You share your screen. Well, uh, I'll take the opportunity to ask you this question uh, I made a uh, poll with. Will we see other Palantir short wrappers? Uh, here, uh, the results say 63% of the people think uh, there will be other short wrappers, which triggers to me the question I received uh, yesterday from um, uh, David uh, from the ByteSide um, channel. He, he asked me, OK, let's say there will be other short wrappers. If you were a short, uh, um, a short hedge fund, what trigger point would you try to crash the stock? So what would you use to, 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 to exactly. get- So you are an analyst at, a, um, at an edge fund. Your job is uh, shorting this company because uh, you feel that it's shady or just because even if you don't really understand the company, you just uh, feel there is uh, a shorting opportunity to make money because there are some certain conditions that uh, you, for you as a short seller are appealing. Like uh, it is a stock which has uh, a retail crowd. Uh, it is a stock that is uh, surfing uh, this uh, wave of the AI that could be already seen uh, as bubbly, but the fact that it's bubble or not really depends on how companies actually implement that. I would so, go the AI angle. I would, I would go that angle. I would be like AI's, AI's buzz. It's not as big as we think it is. GPUs are real. NVIDIA is real. Maybe Tesla FSL is real. Palantir is just a chat GPT for companies. It's not real. That would be my angle if I had to go. Mm -hmm. I was just hoping the stock was going to go down lower so I could buy more shares. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of us, yeah. I was like, yeah. oh, come on. Let this crap actually send it back. And that's the thing. The, the price was resilient. As, yeah. like, it's been resilient all week. And yeah. against the bear report to 50,000 subscribers, nothing. Barely, it hit all time highs that day. 15, 20. Even Airbnb uh, suffered a bit uh, when uh, yeah. the Cave uh, dropped a report on that. And Airbnb is already a huge company, is uh, yeah. 3x at Palantir or some or 2x. Uh. Mm -hmm. The stock's getting resilient, man. The stock is getting resilient. I don't know if it gets back down to nine or 10. Maybe it gets so a little Sachin lower. said, I'll get my opportunities. I just and see, and, but here's the thing. If, if the retail community is as big as we think it is, and all of us are like, oh, we wish we bought it at nine, 10, or even 11. If it gets back down and we start seeing a dip, I think a lot of us will start getting back in. And that's going to be a little bit harder for it to keep going lower, you know? Mm. So Maybe we'll, we'll have uh, another saga of uh, very tail people against Wall Street. Because I'll tell you, from how short sellers think, seeing a lot of retail means, uh, ooh, yummy food, uh, food to, <laughs> to smash. But uh, the problem is uh, if uh, you go against uh, a crowd of retail that are actually informed, uh, Short sellers can actually risk a lot. So, so far, the short sell, the short uh, interest is not high, but who knows? Maybe if uh, pa the Palantir stock moves uh, in a direction that uh, makes them even more, uh, more uh, angry, and then you start seeing more short sellers arguing the same things, uh, you will have uh, a similar phase like uh, Tesla when it was heavily shorted. Yeah, Nick, to this super chat, thank you for that. If Pouncher's a GameStop run-up, will long-term investors face any risk? I think all of us would sell if it ran up to like 250 in a month, right? So if that does happen, yeah, long-term investors will face a risk, but the risk will be to get out as soon as you can because that's crazy, right? GameStop, whatever crazy run-up it has, and then just get back in when it's uh, when it comes back to earth. But I don't think yep. it's going to have a GameStop run-up. Yep. I, would, I would follow that. But I think one of the things I think people don't recognize is just like with the NHS thing, right? It's probably a Soros-based 
uh, Soros backed sort of problem, right? And you saw the same thing with Twi when Elon bought Twitter. You know, you're always going to have these billionaires that play in the shadow governments and try to use the public as bait. And so you have to think, you know, it, it, there's always going to be something along the lines with Palantir that is always going to be, um, you know, in billionaires fighting in proxy with each other because somebody didn't want to go to Ukraine or. Uh, you know, there's there's a billionaire like Soros that's in the UK and he always wants the UK to fail for some reason. Uh, or, you know, maybe there's going to be somebody in South America that tries to have some sort of campaign like, oh, American spies want to take over South America. And, you know, it's, it's funded by somebody that's extremely wealthy in South America who probably doesn't want things to change the way that they are because he's already a billionaire in South America. Right. So you have to think that a lot of times these things come out just like how Bill Gates was shorting Tesla, right? Like what was the reason for Bill Gates to short Tesla? You know, he already has billions upon billions of dollars that he's focusing on changing the world with the Bill and Melinda Gates foundation. Why is he trying to put billion dollar, you know, short shorts within, within Tesla? It doesn't make any sense. And I think a lot of it is just billionaires playing billionaire boy club with each other and, and it's their playground and they're trying to bully each other around. And I think in the end of the day, a lot of people don't really think about it that way. It gets fed with the propaganda and an MO of, of one way or another, just like what happened with the NHS thing. Um, but you have to think it's, it's this on a smaller scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, I get paid to, to make in investment videos and, and highlight investor reports on my YouTube channel about gold companies or, you know, other small cap companies as well. You know, I'm not sitting there being like, oh, you should buy the stock, right? But I'm sitting there, you know, kind of overviewing the presentation. Um, and you know, I have CEOs on the channel as well. So it's like, you, you have to think like these people do this all the time. They go on CNBC and kind of put their stock out there. It's no different than people coming on Twitter and putting out a bear report. Um, you know, the Jacob CEO went on CNBC. What is he trying to do? He's trying to pump up the stock. Right. And Jim Cramer, you know, just do it the opposite of what he always says, because it always is the wrong thing. Who knows? Maybe he's being paid off by everybody as well. But, um, you know, it's it's no different. You have to think at the end of the day, all these things are run by advertising, just like Amit's YouTube channel. It's run by advertising. Twitter run by advertising. CNBC, Fox Business run by advertising. Right. So it's about getting eyes on your on your on your articles, not about really the truth anymore. People don't really have that sort of real, um, you know, I guess what's the word I'm looking for? Integrity. Not saying that your YouTube channel doesn't have integrity on it, but I'm just saying when you think about the news, they're more so, you know, trying to scare people out of investing in the stock market. Yeah, you got to get people to click. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, the, that, that's the hard part about being a content creator is not selling your soul for the yeah. click, but still deliver over the last value. probably like the first, three months of the year, you probably would have been scared shitless to invest in the stock market. Meanwhile, smart people were picking up your Google and Amazon in the eighties and nineties. And now look, they're in the one twenties again, not to say that it's not going to go back down in the short term. It probably will have a 10 to 15% pullback just because it's a little bit overrun and long in the tooth. But you have to think like CNBC, it took them a long time. Now that they're switching their tone, acting like since we're, within 15% of all time highs that we're going to blow past 5,000 on the S and P it's probably that you should think about the opposite, right? So you always have to think about where people sit and, you know, what their agendas are and perspective, right? We always talk about this perspective. Somebody could say, I think the SP is going down. I don't think you should put money. It's just like, well, yeah, I think the SP is going to pull back five, 10% within the next um, dozen months. Cause it's up 20 odd percent within the last six months. Doesn't mean that in the long term, you know, you shouldn't invest in the S&P 500. It's all about perspective. It's all about understanding where that person's words are coming from, what time frame they're looking at and what their objectives yeah. are, um, what their risk tolerance is. you someone else to get your conviction. You can't borrow yep. Matt's conviction, my conviction, Amit's conviction. Like you can't do your homework, like yep. learn this stuff. If you're willing to risk your finances and do individual investing, and if not, put it in the index and you'll be fine. You'll still yeah. live comfortably by disciplined personal finance behavior.
Yeah. And I think a perfect guess- example of this, and Arnie, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but it's like you had people that were coming onto this show weekly, like yourself, Arnie, that had 80% of their net worth invested in this company. Then you had people like myself who was very much in a diversification. And I have a rather large position, but you compare it in towards of a total portfolio, way less than 80%. I think at one point, and now it's probably at you know, still less than 6%. I think it's still less than 5% of my portfolio. And yet, if I told you the amount of shares, a lot of you guys in the chat section would be like, holy shit, it's a lot of shares. But you think about it, it's, you know, all based off of, um, you know, what what people's risk tolerances are and everything like. And I still have a lot of conviction in the stock. Don't get me wrong. And I use it every day. But it's about what makes me sleep well at night, right? If I lost that, you know, 4,000 shares of Palantir and it goes to zero, I might be upset. But, you know, I'm not going to go bankrupt and I'm not going to be living under the bridge, you know, that's behind me and, you know, and my skyscraper or whatever the hell I live in. Um, Humble brag. Humble brag. But, you know, it it puts things into perspective, right? Versus if somebody else had that, you know, it could be their entire life savings. So you have to think, you know, when these people come on and, and tout things, you know, where they sit and all that. And Arnie, I didn't mean to cut you off. So, no, I, I was just thinking that uh, for us that have done, uh, more than two years of research, we know what we are talking about. Uh, short sellers opportunity would be the biggest opportunity we could have. Because yes. uh, meanwhile, yes. we have yep. a lot, a lot of validations. Before I mentioned uh, the Ukraine, AAP, which are truly important milestone for uh, the company. And uh, every day, this company is uh, destroying its moat or is actually building the, the moat. So if the company is actually building the moat every day, it becomes only a matter of stock price for being happy to buy more. If we will see a bunch of short sellers being convinced, oh, no, 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 this company is overpriced. Actually, that would make us a favor. So please, guys, please, short sellers listening to, to this, at least try to write a good report so that at least I will put the effort to try to understand if I'm right or not. Yeah, I have two things on this. Number one, I'm enjoying the ride because again, I don't want to sell. And I, 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 if it if it if it comes back, yeah, we'll buy. If it doesn't, we I have enough shares where I'm like, well, if this gets to 20, 25 bucks, it'll be nice to see how much I'm up on my portfolio. So I'm kind of just enjoying the ride and hoping it continues. And if it does come back, then it does come back. Second, the macro, yes, might not support the valuation. Uh, as we're all talking about. The problem is if the Fed actually pauses in June, which the Wall Street Journal reported that they're going to, and CPI comes in lower in June and July, we get to like 4.9 to 4.1, the Fed's going to have to really think hard to hike in July. And if they dare don't hike in July and pause, and CPI gets down to the 3.7s by August, September, and it's officially paused, and maybe November there's a cut, the macro might end up supporting a lot of valuations that seemed overstretched. And on top of that, Pouncher is going to have uh, a quarterly earnings by August, in which we're going to see some results where if they don't sandbag and they beat, that is another catalyst, not to mention S&P 500 inclusion coming up early next year. So there's a lot of stuff here. It could retrace, and that would be a really good opportunity. But if it doesn't, then um, it might be. And we're uh, averaging uh, up. And we're averaging up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. let me speculate a little bit. Uh, disclosure, this is more speculation, but uh, based on uh, true facts. Uh, I think we are not in an AI bubble until we have clearly signs that the trend is over. Yes. You know, finance moves with trend. Trends are like themes. Cathy Wood is specialized in themes. And a theme is something that starts very early. Only a few people are interested in that. And then maybe a theme explodes. Everybody talks about that. I'm thinking of ESG. I'm thinking of EV. Every moment has its own uh, trends. What's the trend right now is AI. Our, our job as investors is uh, trying to understand if there is some value in it, is uh, something that actually changes companies. And if that is true, what are the companies that could benefit from it, but for real, not uh, for uh, just the stock price uh, rising. A key sign that the trend is uh, very mature and uh, close to explosion, meaning that, okay, it has done the most uh, they could do uh, in that period is when you see a lot of activity from uh, investment banks, meaning a lot of IPOs, a lot of SPACs, a lot of M&As. That is a sign that uh, the trend (laughs) is basically saturated because if investment banks work so hard to push all these public companies 
public, it means that there is a huge opportunity for the bank to make companies oversell themselves at a crazy valuation yep. to, to get money. And uh, the simple uh, thought I shared <laughs> yesterday was uh, not an AI bubble until uh, Chamath Papalia <laughs> dumps 100 SPACs. Because that is a clear sign. If you do that, it means that it is very convenient for the company to receive money from investors. Because what you are selling, the story, is much more than the business you are trying to develop. The fact that so far, we haven't seen yet exactly how Sachin says. We have a lot of interest in AI, but we haven't seen yet a single AI IPO. This is a sign that uh, we are still very early in this, uh, in this wave. And very it's a early. wave that, uh, as uh, far as we have seen uh, with AIP, is not a buzzword, is not... Uh, well, apart from some company we we know well, um, but uh, in the case of Palantir, we really see clients being happy of the value unlocked. This changes everything. 